It is dumping day at a tuna cannery in the Solomon Islands. Hundreds of hungry sharks surround a canoe, devouring bushels of fish scraps. To fall overboard now would mean certain death. Photographing this awesome feeding frenzy, the in search of camera boat is attacked by several huge sharks. A wooden paddle is bitten in half. Children at play in a tropical paradise, the remote island of Lulasi. At play in shark-infested waters. Yet these children are unafraid. What protects them from the jaws of the killer shark? The Lulasi love the sea monster others fear and harness its power in ways unknown to civilized men. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Whoever enters the sea risks the remote yet ever-present possibility of shark attack. sharp teeth, abrasive skin, and powerful jaws, sharks can strike anyone at any time and in any waters. The lucky few escape with only cuts and bruises, survivors of a close encounter with a curious predator. But the unlucky majority suffer ghastly injuries. In these tragic cases, Man becomes the helpless prey of a wild animal, a killer that sometimes attacks from hunger, but more often from pure aggression. If so inclined, they will attack groups of swimmers, even boats, with sudden fury. Mimi Macera spotted a shark circling her children. Armed with only a piece of driftwood, she managed to rescue them. Spear fisherman Floyd Pear nearly lost his leg. Pearl diver Iona Asai nearly lost his head. Without any warning, something hit me with tremendous force, recalled cameraman Henri Bourse. The shark had taken his leg. Swimmer Albert Cogler lost an arm, a shoulder, and his life. These tattered remains were all that was found of Navy Lieutenant James Neal. Whoever searches for the shark must realize that he places his life in great jeopardy and cannot predict the outcome of a confrontation. To the untrained eye, this shark might appear to be retreating. Just moments after these pictures were taken, however, it suddenly attacked. Marine biologist Dr. Walter Stark managed to escape, but his submarine was severely damaged. Whoever plays with wild sharks soon learns that they have been known to bite the hand that feeds them. In dangerous waters, survival means protection. The shark cage, standard equipment for divers. The shark bubble, underwater observation in comfort and safety. The shark bag, 
effective camouflage for victims of air and sea disasters. It has replaced old-fashioned shark repellent, which was distributed more for morale purposes than in any realistic hope of thwarting an attack. Imaginative inventors have even gone so far as to propose striped wetsuits to confuse sharks. Electric wetsuits to shock them. And underwater parachutes to slow them down. The most widely used protective device is the simplest, a stick. A clout on the nose or a poke at the body is often sufficient to discourage an overly curious shark from getting too close. If a shotgun shell is attached to the end of the stick, it becomes a lethal weapon called a bang stick. Even the bravest diver, armed with a bang stick, is in mortal danger, however, when a shark signals it is about to attack. Arched back, downward pointed fins, erratic swimming, it means that the animal's territorial borders have been violated. It is shark body language for attack. The trigger that unleashes a shark attack is a mystery. Scientists are only beginning to understand how a shark finds its target. All living creatures radiate minute electromagnetic fields, usually detectable only with the most sensitive instruments. Even a small electric current passed through water in which a shark is swimming is sensed by the animal. Thus, the shark may be able to navigate by the Earth's gravity and stalk its victims electronically. The shark's eye is a highly sensitive organ. In the dimmest light, it enhances contrast and detects fast movement, an ideal adaptation for locating prey in dark, murky waters. Sharks are also able to detect vibrations very quickly and from a great distance. Marine biologist Dr. Donald Nelson lowers a loudspeaker into the water, over which he broadcasts a tape recording of struggling fish. The low-frequency, intermittent sound soon attracts a horde of excited sharks. The men in this canoe are dumping bushels of fish scraps, the waste of a tuna cannery. Called by some the swimming nose, the shark is the bloodhound of the sea. Its sense of smell is legendary. A large part of a shark's brain is devoted purely to interpreting odors. Sharks are able to detect even minute quantities of blood. Soon the water churns with the giant fins of hundreds of hunger-maddened sharks, ranging in size from 5 to 12 feet. At times like this, sharks will strike at anything. If a man fell overboard, he would be ripped to shreds in seconds. This is the savage spectacle of shark frenzy, the image of certain death. Ancient Hawaiians knew him as Kamahoali. In the Gilbert Islands, he was Bakoa. In Fiji, Dakawanga. In the Solomons, Bekwa. Throughout the South Pacific, the shark was worshipped as the greatest god. Less than 50 years ago, sacrificial victims were strangled on coral stone altars and thrown to the sharks. But the missionaries who filmed these headhunters in 1900 waged all-out war on the pagan shark god. Countless human lives have been sacrificed to the shark god. 
his followers have dwindled to a handful of true believers. The shark worshippers, however, can still be found by those who search beyond the frontiers of civilization. The shark god Dakawanga, if properly appeased, is the benevolent protector of shipwrecked sailors, ally of fishermen. His name is still remembered with reverence in modern-day Fiji. Tradition says Tuvu Harbor is the sacred ancestral home of Dakawanga. Now, it is an exclusive resort. Tourists, however, never see the shark god. But the women of Yanuda Island claim that the spirit of Dakawanga still lives. It is said that he protects the villagers from attack in this coastal river. The only person ever killed by a shark here was a visitor from another town, a woman who did not believe in the shark god. On another island, a tourist fell overboard and was immediately attacked by a huge shark. A policeman prayed to Dakawanga before jumping bravely into the bloody water to attempt a rescue. Miraculously, it seemed, the shark released its victim and swam peacefully away. Rather than relying on the shark god's mercy in the future, authorities are building guardrails. In still another village, a bricklayer claims he was saved by the shark god when his boat sank far out at sea. He says for two days and two nights, he rode on the back of a huge shark, which carried him to shore with an escort of smaller sharks. A few witch doctors occasionally include the shark god in their incantations. Kondroya, one of the most powerful witch doctors, regularly toasts Dakawanga as he drinks a native potion. Twice a year, he and his apprentice perform the ritual of the sacred tooth. They believe the shark god appears at midnight to accept the offering. Fables and symbolic ceremonies are all that remain of what was once the all-powerful religion of Fiji. Missionaries and other newcomers have toppled Dakawanga from his throne in most of the South Pacific Islands. In the tiny village of Laulasi, however, the shark god still reigns supreme. In the Solomon Islands, the people of Lolasi cling precariously to the Stone Age. Adventurer Terry Hannigan is returning to the mysterious island where pagan priests once accepted him as a brother. When I first came to Lolasi in 1973, I was lucky enough to witnessed a lot of occurrences uh, that frankly defied my ability of explanation. Shark calling, particularly the totemic shark, which they were able to call with the performance of a certain rubric. Now, on two occasions, Bosco Renone, the shark priest, was able to call these in virtually on order. Uh, this was quite amazing to me because the animals came from down current where they couldn't have scented the blood from the sacrifice that was put in the water. And it was just one of those things where you say to yourself, there certainly are some new things under the sun. Here, the people's two main cultural backbones have been the worship of their ancestors through the spirit shark and through the making of shell money. Now that I've come back, I notice a lot of the old ways changing. A lot of the familiar faces are no longer here. A lot of the people have moved away. Well, the general tenor of village life is missing. The young people all seem to be drawn to the capital where dollars and bright lights seem to beckon them. And it's really saddening for me to, to have to witness it. So, Rana? Yes? What kind of something has happened to a village now since time before the fall here? Me a story now of someone, some fellow white demand. The Australian has a talk in Pidgin English with the villagers. His friend Ramo tells him that the people are bitter and confused. A group of unscrupulous businessmen and corrupt officials from the capital persuaded them to deposit all their worldly wealth in a bank and then embezzled the money, leaving Laulasi destitute. Sios tells another sad story. The young people are moving away for jobs on the mainland. Even worse, they are abandoning the shark god Bekwa. 
Seos fears a terrible curse has been put upon Lolasi by enemies. Only the strongest magic can save them. Mosikuru None feels that he should make a special sacrifice to summon the shark god. If Bekwa answers, the curse will be broken. If not, the people must assume their shark god has deserted them. Before the sacrifice can take place, the living dead must be consulted. A 90-year-old holy man who calls himself Moses will play a key role. He lives alone in a hut, taboo to all but a few lesser priests. His days are spent talking to the ghosts of the dead. He will pray to the shark spirit for the blessing of his ancestors for what is about to occur. If a loved one dies in Lolasi, the body is fed to the sacred sharks. Only the head is preserved, wrapped in leaves. When Moses chants to the skulls, he believes he is talking to the dead whose spirit lives on in the body of the shark. In a sacred glen behind the taboo hut, a pit 20 feet deep has been dug to hold 17 generations of Laulasi skulls, ready to be consulted in times of crisis. The spirits have given Moses approval to proceed with the ceremony. dance in honor of Bekwa, he who helps them to find fish and shells, he who guides their boats to safety. Osikuru delivers the ceremonial pig. A few generations ago, the sacrifice would have been human. The shark priests prepare the offering according to the secret ways of their faith. Women call on Bekwa to protect their men and children, to keep any renegade sharks from attacking them. This is a village where everyone spends at least several hours a day swimming in waters full of dangerous sharks. Yet, the Lolasi claim that no villager has ever been attacked by a shark, except one man who denied the power of Bekwa. The sacrifice is about to begin. Mysteriously, sharks have gathered in the waters near the taboo hut just moments before the shark priests appear. Terry, Ramo, and the male villagers are now participants in a religious communion which has been shared by the Lolasi people and the sharks for hundreds of years. The sacrifice is placed in the water by Bosikuru with a prayer to the spirit shark. Twenty yards away, children play unafraid. The great spirit shark appears, an awesome ten-footer. According to Bosikuru, it is essential that this shark be the first to take the offering. Only then may the lesser sharks follow. The spirit shark circles the bait, but does not bite. Through age-old secret prayers, Bosikuru calls to the sharks. Other sharks move in expectantly, 
ready for their part in the drama. Now, Bosikuru must pray to Bekwa. Let the spirit shark be the first to strike. Suddenly, Bekwa takes the sacrifice. Faith has been rewarded. The devil has been defeated. The others move in quickly, finishing off the sacrifice in a sudden frenzy. The ancient bond between man and shark has been kept alive. But for how long? Songs of praise to Bekwa now ring throughout Laulasi. The shark god has answered. These people will always have a special corner of my heart all to their own. I've got a lot of good friends here, people who will still be friends of mine in a lot of years to come, even though their way of life uh, may not outlive the friendship. Luckily enough, Bosgrunone, the shark priest, is still able to call sharks and still able to call the particular shark they worship. But one wonders that with his passing, will this continue? It saddens me to think that this centuries-old way of life may very soon shudder to a halt. The Lolasi people represent the final spiritual link between man and shark. They alone swim in dangerous waters unafraid. They alone call on the shark god and have their prayers answered. If they possess mystical powers over the sea monster we fear, their secret will be lost forever with the passing of the ancient religion. When their culture dies out, there will be nobody left to love the shark.